Hello friends, my name is AJ and welcome to my channel. This is my first video on AP Computer Science A, and this video will be an in-depth review on Unit 1, Primitive Types. I'll go over all the topics uh, from Unit 1 according to the College Board's course description, and then uh, at the end I'll provide a practice test and the answers to that practice test so that you can test yourself. Without further ado, let's get started. All right, so the first thing uh, that we want to mention with um, Java, and that's kind of the first, this part will be used in everything, and that is the concept of a variable, right? And a variable is used to store data, to store data in the RAM or the random access memory of the computer, right? The computer's memory. So random access memory. Okay, and the analogy that I like to use of the variable is uh, that of a storage box, right? Because you can put anything inside of that storage box and then you can keep it on the side. You can keep it somewhere safe where you can then refer to it later. You may be able to add stuff into the box or remove stuff out of the box. You can put a label on the box, right? And all of those things uh, kind of go together with this concept of a variable for uh, Java as well as you know, certain containers, right? Maybe better for certain things that you're holding, right? So for example, you wouldn't want to use a, um, like a mesh trash can, right? If you're trying to store a liquid because everything would just pour out. Likewise, you wouldn't want to use a, um, you know, a plastic box if you're moving you know, maybe a pet guinea pig or something. You'd want to have something that is a little bit more mesh so that there is some um, oxygen coming in, right? So you have to vary kind of the types of, um, of containers that you use to hold different things. And that is a very, that is a very important concept also with a variable, right? Because when you create a variable, you want specific types uh, for each variable to hold the type of data that you want to hold. So in order to create a variable in Java, you have to use a specific, um, a specific format or a specific structure. The first thing you do is you specify the data type or the type of the variable, right? That you are of the type of the data that you want to hold inside of the variable. Then the next thing is the name, okay? The name of the variable, what you're going to refer uh, to the variable as later on in your code or in your program, right? So that name is also very important that to specify correctly. Then the next component after the name is going to be the assignment operator. That's it's a fancy name for an equal sign in Java. It's basically that you're assigning a value to a newly created variable of the uh, name that you specified before. So this is the assignment operator. Okay, and then to the right of the assignment operator, to the right of the assignment operator, you put a value, right? The value that you actually want to store inside of your variable. So again, if you go back to the box analogy, this is what you're putting inside of the box, right? The name is more um, associated with the label that you may put on the box so that you can refer to it later. And the type would again be more similar to the type of container that you're using. So you put value, right? And then after the value, you put a semicolon. So you put a semicolon. And that is standard convention in Java. As we do more things that are, um, you know, not just creating variables, you'll see that semicolons are usually follow every single line. All right. So this right here, this name, uh, this type name equals value. This is the standard format to create a variable. All right. Now, when we talk about types, the type, right, is this first thing. There are different types of variables that you can create in Java. And for AP Computer Science, there are four main ones that we are focusing on. The first one is going to be the integer type, okay, the integer type. And if you remember from math, uh, this term may, you may be uh, familiar with this term from a math class. And basically an integer is going to be a whole number, right? So examples, right, would be eight or seven or 15 or negative 34, right? or even negative a million and two. So it's any number, it can be from negative, you know, it can be from really, really far on the negative side to um, really, really far on the positive side, but it's a whole number that does not have any decimal places. All right, that's very important. It does not have any decimal places. Now, uh, if you noticed, I was careful not to say from negative infinity to infinity. 
uh, at the end of the actual, um, the end of this review, uh, as we're wrapping up, you'll see the, um, that there's actually a minimum and maximum in Java that we can store as an integer. But for right now, it's going to be almost any whole number uh, that you can use. All right. So an integer is a whole number. Now, in order to specify right, the, type as a, uh, the type of your variable as an integer, you want to use the int keyword. So you want to use the int keyword. That will specify that the new variable that you are creating is going to be of the integer type. All right. Now the next data type, which is also a numerical data type, is going to be double. Okay, double. And double is a number. However, it is a number with with decimal places. So this could be example for 12.6 or 8.2 or 3.14, right? Pi. It could even be, and this is something that is very confusing and I will go over in the future, it can even be numbers like 1.0 or 8.0. Yes, they are equivalent to an integer. However, because you have 0 0.0, though, even though that those decimal places, you know, there's no actual value there, still 0, 0.0, it still counts as a decimal place. And so uh, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more examples in a second. However, that is a double. So double can be any, any number with a decimal place as well as 0 0.0 or you know, 0 0.000 or something like that. And the keyword you use to create a double is simply double, right? Lowercase. So it's a lowercase i and a lowercase d, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a second. Now, the third data type for Java is the Boolean the Boolean type. And the Boolean type is simply going to be true or false values, right? It's a binary choice. You either have yes or no, true or false. That is what a Boolean is. You can only have two possible values as a Boolean, true or false. And uh, that is, and you may be wondering, well, you know, how is that useful? But, it's, but it can be very useful, right? Think about a light switch. When you have a light switch, you're either going to have on as a light switch or off right? You're not going to have, um, unless you have a very fancy slider light switch, it's going to be um, either a true or a false, right? It's on or it's off. It's a binary choice. And so uh, Booleans are actually very useful. And uh, there's an entire unit dedicated uh, pretty much to Booleans called the uh, called conditionals, which uh, will be coming up in the future. But, you know, for now, Booleans are just true and false. And then the actual keyword we use for Boolean is Boolean, also with a lowercase s. All right. Now, the last major data type in, uh, in AP Computer Science, which is one that will be heavily used, is the string type. The string type. And strings are just text values, right? So text values. This includes multiple characters. For example, you know, your name is a string or you know, an address is a string because you have words, right? It's words. You can have sentences as a string, words as a string. Strings pretty much encompass all characters, you know, from A to Z, zero through nine, everything. However, uh, they are listed as text. So let's say you put a string as, you know, nine zero, that's gonna be text nine zero. You won't be able to do math with that, right? It's, it's, it's set as text. Okay, and now the keyword we use to create a string type is going to be string. Now the key, now the key thing here to notice is that there is a capital, a capital string is specified using a capital, a capital letter, and when it's capital, we refer to this as a reference data type, a reference data type, and strings. It's very important to remember this. Strings are pretty much of the four, the only reference data type. And what reference data types actually are will be explored further. However, it's just kind of a concept that you just have to know at this point, and then you'll really understand what a reference data type actually means, uh, probably by the next unit, unit two, or at unit, um, I think it's unit five, okay? And now the all the other three that are lowercase, these are all known as primitive primitive data types, right? And these are lowercase. They are built in uh, to the computer. They're not object-based. And again, that, that term of object-based, that'll be explored further in the next unit. But it's just important to remember that strings are reference data types and integers, booleans, and doubles are 
pr uh, primitive data types. So now we explored the type part. We explored this type part right here. Um, right here, we explored this type part and we talked about all of the four main data types in Swift. The next thing we're going to be talking about are the names, what you can name variables, right? And the thing is, is when you're specifying a name in Java, you do not want to include any spaces. It should be no spaces. There shouldn't be any spaces in your name. And it's also common convention to use something called camel case when uh, specifying your name. Basically what that means is, let's say it's multiple words together as your name, the first part, the first word is going to be lowercase, but then all words afterward are going to be uppercase. So for example, if I had, you know, something like uh, today's a great day, right? Today would be lowercase, is would be uppercase with an I, and then a great right, day. So you, you have to make after the first word, everything else, the first uh, letter of that word will be capitalized. And that's just common convention in uh, Java. Some languages, it's a little bit different, but Java's main, um, that's kind of convention, right? It's convention. You can name variables kind of, you know, you don't have to do it as Campbell case, but it's proper convention. And you'll see it in examples and probably quizzes, tests, probably even the AP exam using camel case. All right, so make sure that your name is in camel case. And now the next thing is value, right? What do you put in to the value part? All right, and the first thing you do is our first example is, for example, eight, right? You could put in eight, you could put 12.1, you could put even 6.0. And then for Booleans, you can put true or false. And that will be as either, that will be all lowercase. So for example, true is a possible value. And then let's say I want to put in text like hello, that I can also do. But you have to be, uh, this is something that you have to you have to notice, okay? When you're creating a string, you want to make sure your text is surrounded by double quotation marks, okay? They're very important, otherwise the computer will think that you are referring to another variable instead of actually a string. All right, so you make sure you have those quotation marks. So again, just for review, right, you can say that eight is an integer, right, because it is a whole number. 12.1 uh, is a double because it has a decimal place. And remember, so is 6.0. 6.0 is also a double, and it's also a double because it has 0, 0.0 at the end. Even though it's equivalent to six, which is an integer, it's still a double because you have the uh, 0, 0.0 at the end. And then the other thing here, this is a Boolean, right? This is a Boolean because it's either true or false. And then the last thing is it's this is a string. And of course, strings are surrounded by double quotation marks, all right? So now uh, I can move into some examples of actually creating some variables, right? So for example, example, right? I can create an integer. For example, if I want to create an integer named my integer, I can simply do that by doing uh, int, right? Because I'm following the exact same structure I specified up here. I put the type, remember using these type keywords, right? I will say int and then the name. And because I want to name it my integer, I'm going to use camel case. So I'm going to say my integer the assignment operator, which is the equal sign, and then the value I want to set it to, right? Because I am doing an integer, right? It needs to be a whole number. So let's say I set this to eight, for example. That's a whole number, that'll work. So I'm creating an integer, which um, or an integer variable named my integer, which is storing the value of eight. Now the next thing is I can create an example for a double. Right, so double, let's say I create a double variable named my double, right? I can do assignment operator and then I can set the value. In this case, I can set the value for two, example, 7.6, right? Because that is a double, it is a um, number with a decimal place. And then for an example for a Boolean, again, I use the Boolean keyword that's specified up here first, then the name of the variable, which again, I'll use camel case. For example, let's just say is awesome right? And because AP computer science is awesome, we're going to put true as the value here. 
All right. Now the last thing is to create a string. So let's say that I do string. And then my name also in camel case. And of course, you know, when you're naming a variable, try to make the actual name of the variable something relevant, right? You just, you don't want to just put, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F. It'll get very, um, it'll get very confusing after a while when you have a bunch of variable names that don't make sense. So try to make your variables have a name that's somewhat relevant to the type of data that, or what data you're actually storing. Right. So in this case, because I named my my uh, string my name, I should be storing my name inside of the string, right? Because it makes sense. It's logical. So I'll use an assignment operator, and then I put my name. And remember, because this is a string, there has to be quotation marks around my name. Okay. In order to, again to create a string, you have to have quotation marks around the the actual text. And then lastly, of course, the semicolon. So that is, those are the examples of creating four different variables uh, of all of the different four types. Now the next thing which I want to uh, talk about is a constant, all right? And a constant is basically a variable whose value, whose value cannot be changed. So if you remember from possibly science labs or something, right, you have variables, you have constants. Constants don't change, they remain the same. Variables do change. So in this case, you can create a constant where its value cannot be changed later on, all right? So let's say um, I have my, my, you know, type name equals value, right? And this is the variable, this is in order to create a variable. So this is variable initialization. And now when I refer to that, uh, when I refer to initialization, I basically mean creating a variable and setting a value for that variable. That's what initialization means. So in order to create a constant, all I have to do is I have to add the final, the final keyword in front of the variable that I am creating, right? I am um, declaring it as final in order to create a constant, right? So this is how to create a constant. Now, generally, when you're creating a constant, you'll want your name to be in all an all uh, uppercase. However, you know that's not necessarily that's also more of a convention. However, if you forget to do that, that is you know that's also normal. So, for example, let's say I want to um, create an example of a constant. For example, uh, an integer, and because I'm creating a constant integer, I want to use the final keyword, right? Final, and then int, and then let's say that my um, the integer that I'm trying to create is hours um, in a day, right? And that's going to equal 24. Now again, remember, uh, because I am creating a um, a final here. It, it needs to make sense that I'm not going to need to change it later, right? The number of hours in a day never changes. There's never going to, well, I mean, unless some, some major um, interstellar event happens, we're generally going to always have a 24 hour you know, day. And so that's not going to change. Therefore, it's a constant. For example, your birthday, your birthday is never going to change. It would make sense to keep it as a final. And uh, the reason why people actually use finals is mainly for, for example, security or, you know, they don't want something to be changed, which should, which actually shouldn't be changed. Okay. Now the next thing, the next topic is changing, changing the value of variables. So changing the value of variables. Because remember, if a constant's its value cannot change, variables can change. And in order to change it, you use the assignment operator. So what do I mean by that? Let me show you an example. So let's say I create an integer, and I'll simply call it my integer, just like the example above, and I set it equal to seven, right? In order to change the value, let's say I wanna change the value from seven to eight, what I do is I put the name of the variable, and remember, I do not use, this time I do not use the type. Right here, I use the um, here I used the type, and then the name equals this because I am editing an already existing variable. I don't need to specify the type. All right, this time, so I will simply say my integer equals 
8, right, equals 8. Now the thing is, is again, in order to change the value of a variable, you use the assignment operator, use the assignment operator, which is the equal sign, and then you place the new value to the right of it, the new value to the right of the assignment operator. All right. So now also another line of code, which is very important, especially when you're learning Java, is the system.out.println uh, line of code. All right. So that would be system.out.println. And basically, when you um, what print line does is it displays the value of a variable. And the variable that you want the value to display goes inside of these parentheses right here. So for example, if I want my um, the variable my integer, if I want to see the value of that, I would simply put it in parentheses. And then when I run my code, it will output 8, right? Which basically shows that the value did change from 7 to 8. All right, so again, for reference, this is very important. System to dot dot print line displays displays the value of a variable. All right. Now the next thing is um, I can show another example. Let's say for uh, my other types, such as a boolean. So for example, if I had boolean, and let's say I just name this flag equals true. Right? I can then change it by, again, just doing the name, the assignment operator, and then the new value that I want to set it to. I Remember, do not include the type keyword. And then let's say I have a string. So I say string. Uh, let's say my grade at some point was a B. Right? I can change it by doing my grade right, equals A, just like that. Now, only if only you could do this in real life, right? But in code, you can change the value. If as long as it's a variable and not a constant, you can change the value. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, and this mainly uh, has to do, go, do with the integer and the double, is doing math, right? Arithmetic. So in uh, in Java, you can do math with variables, right? Fun. So in order to do math, you have to use the um, arithmetic operators, right? Arithmetic operators. And a lot of these you're used to, right? You have the the uh, the plus sign, right? Which is addition. The uh, subtraction sign, which is subtraction. The asterisk, which is multiplication. The, um, the slash, which is division. But then we also have a new one. We have the percent sign. And this is, this is modulo or modulus. So again, this is going to be addition. This is going, got an I there. This is going to be subtraction. This is going to be multi multiplication. And this is going to be division, right? And then this right here is going to be modulus or modulo. And basically what this does is it actually finds the remainder of the division of two values. So for example, Let's say I had the statement 12 modulus 5, right? What this means is it's going to be the remainder of 12 divided by 5. So let's say I do 5, right, divided by 12. 5 goes into 12 two times, so I subtract 10, and my remainder is 2. So I would say that 12 modulus 5 is equal to 2. Right. So now uh, here are some examples, and I do a lot of examples showing all of the different um, operators in use. All right. So let's say I do here examples. Now let's say I create an integer. Right. My integer, I'll name it sum, and I say sum is equal to eight plus seven. Right. Then if I were to do system dot out dot print line, which again, remember, uh, displays the value of a variable, and I put sum in here, right? This is going to output the value of 15, because that's 8 plus 7, okay? Now, let's say I do one for difference, and this time I'll just do a, 
um, I'll do a double as an example. So double, right, uh, diff for difference equals 17.0 minus 7.0, right? If I do system dot out dot print line uh, diff, this is going to give me a value of 10.0. Now, this is also something that's very um, that's very important. When you're doing um, any operation with a double, okay, the value is or the the resultant type is going to be a double type, okay. So when you're example doing the difference of seventeen point zero minus seven point zero, the the final type is going to be ten point zero. It's going to be a double. It's not going to be ten, which is an integer. So that's something to keep in mind. And now I'll also show in the next example another situation where this happens. This is for the product. So let's say I do double, right, product equals seven, right, just seven, times 2.0. If I were to do the system dot out dot print line of my product, Right, so I'm getting the value out of my product variable. The value that it's going to give me, right, is 14.0. And again, remember, because this here, right, this is an int. This is an integer. And this here is a double. This is a double. So because I have a double in my problem, even if I have any integer, if I have a double, my type, my resulting type will be a double. And now this and now this example can also be done with division. Let's say I do double a quotient equals 3.0 divided by 2, right? And I can do these uh, system dot out dot print line of my quotient. This is going to display the value of 1.5. And again, this is a double. Right, because I had a double in my problem, 3.0 was a double. Now, I also have a very interesting case here in my next example. Let's say I do double, right, quotient 2 equals 3 divided by 2. Now, both of these are integers, right? Both of these are integers. If I do system dot out dot print line and I do quotient two, right, this is going to result in one point zero. This is going to result in one point zero. Now, why would it result? Why in the world, right, would it result in a one point zero? And actually, in this case, I'm going to make sure that this is just one so I can change my type to int. So this is going to be one, right? The answer is going to be one. Now, why is it one, right? Why isn't it 1.5, right? Which makes sense. Three divided by two is 1.5. But remember, in this case, I have two integers, okay? I do not have any double. And because my data types here was an integer and this was an integer, my resulting type will be an integer. So when I'm doing division with integers, integer division, and really any operation with integers, uh, truncates. What do I mean by truncates? It basically means that it's going to cut off all of the decimals at the end. It's not going to round. It's going to cut off. Right, so that's why it doesn't give me 1.5. It also doesn't give me two because it doesn't round. It just takes 1.5, it cuts off the decimals and removes them. So my answer is one, and that is um, definitely that's definitely something to get used to. And you always need to check. You always need to check what type your um, your final uh, variable is going to be, and you have to remember and you have to check the types of your. Um, of your actual operation. In this case, three is an integer and two is an integer. So you have to um, divide, and when it divides, it's going to be uh, truncated because both are integers. And now my last example is going to be using modulus. So int um, modulo equals, and then here I'm simply going to take my quotient two and I'm going to put it here. 
right? And then divided by two. Now this is always something interesting, right? Whenever I am doing any sort of operation, I can use other variables, right? Because those are values. I simply took, right, through the uh, previous the previous example, I stored one as the value of quotient two. So when I do um, quotient two and I put that here, it's really saying that it's really the placeholder for one, right? Because the variables, the variable's value is one. So when I put it into a, a problem like this, it's going to take that value and it's going to try to use that value. So in this case, it's going to do one modulus two, right? And uh, if I were to do system dot out dot print line modulo, right? This is going to give me a value of one, right? Because let's say I do, this is really one divided by two, all right? One modulus two is one divided by two, and then we're finding the remainder of that. So if I do two into one, right, two goes into one zero times with a remainder of one. So my final value for the variable is going to be one. Now also, you can do um, arithmetic uh, operations to create other variables. However, you can also do to modify the value of a variable itself. So for example, uh, I'm going to title this here modifying uh, modifying values with uh, math, right? So let's say I create an integer, so int x equals 7, right? Just like that. If I want to add 1, for example, to my variable, I can simply do, I can simply do x equals, and then I take this here, x, right, plus 1. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking my value of 7, right? This is really 7 because 7 is, uh, is set there. So 7 plus 1, right? 7 plus 1 is equal to 8. And then I'm taking this and I'm assigning it back to the, to the x variable. So I'm replacing the value of 7 that was there now with 7 plus 1. I'm putting in 8 there. So if I were to, first I'm going to erase some of this. Right. If I were to do system dot out dot print line, right on x right here, it's going to give me the value of eight. So now I've changed the value by simply assigning a new value to it, but I'm using some math there. And in fact, there's an even shorter way to add or subtract or multiply or divide or even uh, find the modulus from a value. So let's say I take this and I do x, right, which is again now equal to 8. x is now equal to 8 because that I changed the value above. I could do x plus equals 2. x plus equals 2. And if I were to do system dot out dot print line, right, uh, on x, it's going to give me a value of 10 because it's adding two to the value of x. And uh, these right here are called compound assignment operators. And the compound assignment operators that are in Java are plus equals, right, which adds to a, a value, minus equals, which subtracts from a value, times equals, which finds the product of the current value and um, whatever else, right, on the uh, right side. Uh, divide equals, which finds the quotient of the current value divided by another value. And then modulus equals, which finds the remainder of this value divided by another value. And so these are all compound assignment operators. Okay, compound assignment operators. And in fact, there's even one more type of operator in math, which is very cool in Java. There is the increment operators, the increment operators. 
okay? And these are plus plus and minus minus. This basically allows you to add, a val add one to a variable and subtract one to a variable. So for example, I can just do, you know, a quick example, var x equals eight. And then I simply do x plus plus, and that's it. I don't even have to have a value. So there is a way to add one to a value without even using a number in the statement. So I can do pl uh, x plus plus. And then uh, if I do system dot out dot print line, right, of x, this is going to give me the value of nine because it's incrementing to the variable. And that is very useful for a quick addition and subtraction. Now, the last major concept in unit one is known as casting, casting uh, variables. And casting always, uh, it confuses, it can confuse some people at first simply because it's, it's a little bit of a, um, you have to kind of really think through what's happening, right? But basically casting, refers to converting one type or one data type into another. And the main two types that you cast between are integer and double. Of course, because they're both numerical types. So it makes sense that you'd cast between you know, an integer and a double. It doesn't make sense to cast between a double and a Boolean, for example, right? That doesn't make sense. However, an integer to a double does make sense. So for example, let's say I do integer D equals, and then let's say I have 7.8, right? Which is going to be a, um, a double, right? And I want to cast it to an integer, right? So that it works when I try to put it into a variable um, whose type I specified as int. In order to cast a variable, you simply do parentheses and then the type you want to cast to and close parentheses. So just like this, uh, int d equals and then int in parentheses 7.8. So now if I were to do system dot out dot print line d, right? This is going to give me a value of seven. Seven and again, you have to remember even the same with when we were doing division. Integer always truncates. Integer always truncates. So it's simply going to cut off all of the decimals at the end. Even though it does round to eight, it's not going to round. It's just going to cut the decimals off. So if you do, if you cast seven point eight, which is a double to an integer, your value is going to be seven. It literally takes this value cuts off all of the decimals off of it, and then you're left with the value there, okay? Now let's say I want to do um, double, so double, right? And let's say I set this, uh, or I name my double i equals six, and six is an integer. In order to cast it, I would do double, right, in open and close parentheses in front of the integer value. And if I were to uh, print this out, so system dot out dot print line, and I try to print i, it's going to give me a value of 6.0 because a, a, um, a double has decimal points. So it will be 6.0. Now the last major thing um, of, this, of this thing, which recaps, and this is what I was talking about in the beginning, where remember I said that I was not careful I was careful to not say um, that integers are from negative infinity to infinity. They have a minimum and maximum value. So there is the minimum, minimum and maximum values, right, for an integer. And why is this? This is because an integer, so an integer, right, is stored as four bytes. An integer is stored as four bytes of RAM. And a bits, bytes, as well as the binary system, hexadecimal system, octal system, and all these systems I will be covering in a separate video. That's more of an that's more of a prerequisite actually for for all of these units. I don't believe that is any that is in the course description, like under the actual unit information. So there will be a video coming very soon explaining all of the different um all of the different 
uh, base systems that you'll have to know. And bytes and bits all have to do with binary. However, the maximum, that, that's why that there's a maximum minimum value that you can store in four bytes. So in order to access the minimum and maximum value for an integer, you do integer dot min underscore value, right, in all caps, and then the underscore, and integer dot max value. You have to copy exactly how it is, right? Min value, max value are all capitalized. An integer is spelled all the way out with a capital I. And again, this will have to do with, as I'll explain a little bit later, and probably a different unit, right? You're, you're referring to this time the reference type of an integer and not the primitive type. Again, you don't need to worry about that. Just know for the um, minimum and maximum, you do it this way. And so now the values for each of these, so the value for uh, the minimum is going to be negative uh, 2,147,483,648. That is the smallest number you can have to be stored in the integer, All right? And then you have 2,147,400, or sorry, 2,147,483,000, 647 as your maximum. And remember, this is a little bit lower. This is lower by one. And the reason why this is lower by one is because you're counting zero as a non-negative number, right? That's why it's lower by one, because you're counting zero. You don't go from negative one to one. So this is lower uh, because you count zero. Now, let's say you want to store a value that's like five trillion or something, right? Much larger than a billion or negative two billion. Then you could use a different, uh, you can use a different data type and you can use the data type called long. Long is also a primitive data type. However, that's not necessarily covered in AP computer science. So you don't really have to worry about the long data type. However, if you want to store really large numbers, again, you won't have to for AP computer science. But if you ever need to in Java, you have to use the long data type. So the long data type stores uh, bigger numbers. Stores bigger numbers. All right, so that is the entire recap for unit one primitive types for AP computer science. Now in the description below, I have posted a, um, a little test, a practice test that you can do. And this practice test I believe has around 20 questions and uh, kind of is something that I made, by, um, I made myself. I didn't take questions from um, anybody else. And so basically these, uh, this test kind of encompasses everything you've learned as well as adding a little bit more. So you can test yourself to see if you'll be ready for either your testing class or maybe the AP exam if you just wanna use the, um, the test kind of as a benchmark to really test yourself. And um, I'm actually going to go over. So if you go into the if you go into the description below, you can download it as a PDF, maybe print it out, or just answer in a separate sheet of paper. And um, I am now going to go over the answers uh, for that particular test. So pause the video here and do it, or come back to the video uh, to see the answers for the actual practice test. And that is going to start right now. All right, everyone, this is the practice test that I made. It is open on my computer in the beautiful app Notability, which is what I've been using uh, throughout this uh, particular review. So this, this has tw uh, 20 questions, as well as a short answer section so that you can kind of practice writing a little bit of code rather than just answering multiple choice questions. Of course, um, <coughs> majority of tests are going to be multiple choice. So I've created a question set, which we're going to go through right now, which kind of encompasses everything for unit one. All right, so let's start with number one, and I'm going to go through and I'm going to do an explanation for each question. So number one, which of the following data types would best represent the number of passengers on an airplane? So you have Boolean double integer string for data types as your answer choices. Well, if we look at it, we know that we're trying to represent the number, right? So number is going to be a numerical type. I'm actually going to make my, um, my pen a little bit smaller here. It's going to be a number. It's going to be numerical. Out of which then I can immediately um, cross out Boolean because Boolean is not a number, right? So I can't store the number 150 inside of a Boolean, right? Now, could you store it in a string? I mean, you could set the text equal to, you know, 150, 
but that's not really helpful because it's not a it's not a number it's not a primary number type and remember my the question underlined the word best so string is definitely not the best choice so now i'm left with doubles which doubles can have um you know decimal places and integers are whole numbers now if i'm looking at passengers on a plane right you're generally going to have whole passengers right you're going to either have one passenger 150 passengers you're not going to have you know the 90.5 passengers or at least hopefully right hopefully you don't have you won't need to have decimal places you don't want parts of people on a plane again that's not i mean in most situations that's never going to happen you don't you know that's not something that uh you you want all right so that that generally when i'm talking about the numbers of passengers on a plane i'm not i'm never going to again hopefully never going to be using um actual decimal places to describe or like decimals like 0.6 of a person to describe somebody i'm going to use it as a whole number so in this case the best answer is integer because it is a number it is a whole number and it represents the the actual thing that i'm trying to represent which is the number of passengers in the best way okay now number two right number two which of the following data types is not considered to be a primitive data type and this one is going to be again pure um kind of memory and and knowing the difference between primitive and reference so we know that the primitive the primitive types are the double the integer and the boolean right and our only reference type that we know so far is the string. So in this case, when it says which of the following are not contributed to be primitive, integer um, and double and Boolean can be crossed off. And remember long, I kind of introduced at the end of the, of the um, video part, long simply refers to a even longer number. So that does not count. The correct answer is string because it is the only non-primitive data type in this list. It is a reference type. All right, number three, when a variable is declared blank, it cannot, its value cannot be changed once it's initialized. And remember, um, synonym for initialize is set. Once the value is set, it cannot be changed. Your answer choices are final, constant, static, and Boolean. First off, we, you, you've never seen static before. That's not in this unit, so static is wrong. And then you have A, B, and D, right? Constant, final, and Boolean. Boolean is a data type. Right? It's not some sort of declaration. So <clears throat> if you remember, I can change the value of a Boolean. I can change it from true to false if I want to. So that is incorrect. Now I'm left with constant and final. In or a variable whose value is not changed is a constant, right? But in order to um, actually make a variable become a constant, you have to declare it as final. So it's a little bit of a um, of some terms that you just have to remember, right? You in order to create a constant, you declare a variable as final. You use the final keyword, right, before the variable, right? To create a constant, you do final name equals or sorry, uh, final type name equals value. Okay. Now, number four, when a variable is initialized, the which is again set, right? The variable uh, the variable is associated with the location in the computer's blank that is used to hold this variable. This one again is pure is a pure memory. This is going to be RAM. When you create a variable, it is created to be stored in RAM or random access memory. So processor, graphics card, definitely not graphics card. Processor, graphics card, and CPU are incorrect. All right, number five, which of the following uh, data types best, again, keyword best, I'll change my color as I do for every question, uh, best represents the position of a light switch is on or off as it's only two states. Keywords, only two states, meaning on, off, yes, no, true, false, it's a binary choice. And the only variable type or only data type that stores a binary choice is going to be Boolean, right? Either on or off, right? Which is represented, for example, true may represent on, um, false may represent off. So it's, 
a binary choice. And this value, as it's only two states, is the key words here. So it's definitely not a double or integer, and it's also not string. You could use a string, you know, tf, but again, uh, it's not the best data type to use. Number six, which of the following are considered reference data types? Again, this goes back to the same thing we did over here. Primitive types are Boolean, integer, and double, and reference types are string. So it says which of the following are considered reference type? String is, Boolean, and integer aren't, so the correct answer is going to be A, which is one only. Okay? Now, number seven. <laughs> this one is a little bit interesting, which required you to think a little bit. Which of the following data types would best represent a student ID number that may have leading zeros that must be included in the value? So let me give an example. A student ID may be 918826, right? It could be 00072892, right? Or something like that. Now you think, right? And it's very, I mean, this is, this is generally, you know, obvious. It's a, it's a number, so it must be a number type, right? But think about it. If I were to set this value, right, as, for example, an integer, it's going to store it as 72892. It's going to remove the leading zeros because the leading zeros are not important to the value, right? So if I type in, you know, int my int equals 00072892, 0, 0, 0, uh, it's going to store it as 72892. Therefore, if the leading zeros must be included, then storing it as an integer or double is not the best option. And of course, Boolean just out because that's, you know, that's a choice between true or false. So that's just, that's not true either. So you're only left with a string, which is correct. Reason it's correct is because I can store 00072892 as a string. And it will be, and it will be stored with the zeros because it's a character. Remember, it counts as it is text. So that is why string is the best. And of course, you're not really losing anything because you're not going to be doing addition subtraction with this to an ID number, right? It's just going to be stored. So string is the best um, data type to use. All right, now number eight, we're starting to get into a little bit of code. I mean, it's not, not too bad. It's just one line for most of these questions. <coughs> what variable is assigned, uh, or what value is assigned to the variable A in the code below? You have um, int, a equals 7 plus 8. 7 plus 8 is 15. All right, and I'm storing it as an integer data type. Therefore, and I should be using a different color here. I'll go back to my color. Because I'm storing it as an integer type, it's not going to have the decimal places. So 15 is correct. It's not going to be 15.0 because it's an integer. It doesn't have, double, uh, doesn't have decimal places. And it's not a string, right? It's not 7 plus 8. And there's no error that will occur here. Now, number nine, the uh, what value is assigned to the variable w? Right here, I have two doubles, but look over here. I'm storing it as an integer type, all right? So let's say I do 7.0 times 2.5, right? That's going to be, that's going to give me 17.50. That is the result of this. However, I'm trying to store 17.50 inside of an integer type. So because I'm turning it into an integer, what's going to happen? It's going to truncate off all of my decimal places. So the correct answer will be 17. Okay. Now, which of the following is true about arithmetic operations? So one, arithmetic operation uh, uses two integer values will um, evaluate into an integer. That is true. If you have all integer values, it's going to um, compute to an integer type. It is impossible to add one to a variable without ever using the number one in a statement. And this, this kind of goes off of one of those operators. This is false. The reason is because of the increment. The increment operator. I can do, for example, if I do um, in x equals 2, I can do x plus plus, and that's going to add 1, right? So it is possible to add 1 to a variable without ever using the number 1 in the statement. It is possible, therefore, that is wrong. And then the third option, a, a um, arithmetic operation that uses a double will evaluate to a double. That's true. So your answer will be 1 and 3 only, which is D. Okay? Now we move on to number 11. 
right? Which is the variable is assigned to the variable, or what value is assigned to y. This is 14 modulus 4. So if I do 4 into 14, 4 goes into 14 3 times, and I subtract 12, and 2 is left over. Therefore, 2 is my correct answer, right? Because modul uh, modulus is the remainder. Now, number 2, what value is assigned to the variable z in the code below? This is a little bit longer. I have x equals 4, and then 1 plus x divided by 2. Again, Java uh, operates off of order of operations, okay? It's order of operations, just like everything else. So if I do 1 plus, this is really 1 plus 4 divided by 2, which is 1 plus 2. So y equates to 3. So then I do z equals 0, and then I'm using plus equals, which adds to a value. So it's going to be 0 plus 3 times 4. So z is going to be 12. And because I'm asking for what value is assigned to z, the correct answer will be a 12. Number 13, plus equals, minus equals, asterisk equals, divide by equals, and modulus equals is known as... Um, what type of operators? They are known as compound assignment operators. This is more of a vocabulary-based thing. The next question is also more vocabulary-based. The process of converting one data type to another is casting a variable. Casting is correct. Simply, that's just a vocabulary thing that you'll have to remember. And again, it's not initializing. Initializing is setting a value. Okay. All right. Now, number 15. Now, this is, the, this is the question that I really like. I really like this question. And uh, this question, actually, this component, which talks about rounding, comes from the course description. I, I took the code from the course description, and I put it into a question, all right? And, and, I'll be, and I'm very heavily looking off of that course description, especially when I'm making questions, because the course description is from the College Board. They make the test. If they put in the course description, it's likely to be important, all right? So variable x of a double type can be rounded to the nearest integer using which statement, all right? So this is very interesting. You have in x for both positive and negative values of x. So because I'm trying to test this, I'm going to use different test conditions. For example, let's say I have 7.2. This should round to 7, right, if I want to round it to the nearest. So in this case, if I were to do int, right, 7.2, remember this is casting a variable, it will cast it. Because it's casting, it truncates. So all my decimal places go away, and it will become 7. Now, what if I do 7.6? Well, again, if I'm casting, it's going to truncate the end off. So this is also going to be 7. It doesn't actually round up. It doesn't give me 8. It doesn't give me what I want. Therefore, A is not correct. Now, I have B. I, I have now, for both positive and negative values, it's um, x plus 0 0.5, then I actually uh, truncate it, all right? So now let's say I do 7.2, right? Again, I'm going to use the same test case. 7.2 plus 0 0.5 is going to give me 7.7. .7. And if I truncate off the end, right, to cast it, it's going to give me 7. So that's good. Now what if I do 7.6? 7.6 plus 0 0.5 gives me 8.1. If I truncate this, this gives me 8. So it does round. It rounds it, uh, uh, rounds it down for 7.2, and it rounds it up for 7.6. Looking good so far. But now remember, this is for both positive and negative values. So I have to check the negative as well. Let's say I do negative 7.2 plus 0 0.5. Well, now there's a little bit of a problem. This gives me six point ne or negative 6.7. If I truncate this, this gets me to 6. And in fact, that rounded even further down than what I wanted. It didn't give it 7. It gave me a 6. And actually, this would be negative, right? Negative 6 instead of negative 7. Therefore, unfortunately, B is incorrect. However, this C keeps this part of the problem, which we, which we checked over here as working, and then it adds this. You do minus 0 0.5 for negative values of x. If I try this on negative 7.2, minus 0 0.5 is equal to negative 7.7, .7, right? And if I could, if I cast this, I truncate, this will be negative 7. That rounds, right? That rounds properly. What if I did negative 
negative 7.7 .7 minus 0 0.5 equals negative uh, 8.2. Negative 8.2, guess what? When it's truncated, it rounds to negative 8. So this is the correct answer. It worked in all of my test cases. So C is correct, and then D is just not correct, all right? Now the next one, we're, we're almost done. We're at number 16. Which of the following represent the extrema, right? The min and max of what can be stored as an integer. Now, I have to admit, it's a little bit mean here. First, int uh, min max does work. However, <laughs> the actual min value, right, is going to be negative 2,147,483,648. And my max value is 2,147,483,647. So, three is not correct and uh, it is off by one and the reason why I put this in here and why it is only one and two is simply because some teachers or um, you may see in the future on practice problems where they do these kind of things where they try to you know they try to um, kind of trip you up there because they, they try to expect you to at least to know the difference between the min and max and how the max is one less than min so in this case the answer is only one and two all right, now the next question in random access memory, RAM, right? Integers are given a maximum store space of what? And this is going to be four bytes, right? This is again something that you just have to remember. Going to number 18, and this one is one that we did not talk about. So this one you can technically omit because this one we did not talk about. However, it says an attempt to divide an integer by zero will result in which of the following exceptions? Exceptions mean error. And because divided by zero has to do with math, the correct answer is an arithmetic expression or an arithmetic error, okay? Because you can't divide by zero. So uh, <clears throat> again, this is not something that we actually talked about, so you know that's okay. However, it's very important that you uh, that you'll that you should know what the problem is or what problem occurs when you divide by zero. Number nineteen, which of the following is true about arithmetic in Java? So Java follows the order of operations, that is true. Integer division, um, such as five divided by two, will result in two because the integer truncates. And of course, we know that is correct. It doesn't do 2.5, it does two. And then the last one, an integer overflow occurs um, when the following code, also we didn't necessarily talk about this, but using context, you'll be able to you know, understand this. If I try to subtract two from the minimum value, Right? Can I subtract from the already the minimum value? I can't. It goes over. It overflows what the minimum value I can set my integer to. So therefore, that is correct. And with that, it will be 1, 2, and 3. The last question, omit this one. This is going to be converting um, base 10 to hexadecimal. We, we did not talk about this in this particular video, and that will be talked about um, in a future video coming very soon. All right, so that is end of section one. That is the end of the multiple choice section. I hope you did well. This is going to be very reminiscent of certain things that you may see, like some teachers may um, ask in, in a similar way of how I asked for, you know, what's what's the best data type for this? What's the best for this? You know, one, two, and three, very common in the college board tests, you know, those type of multiple choice questions. So this is going to be good review, either if you're reviewing for the AP exam or you're reviewing for a midterm, final exam, in class test, something like that. And of course, the last thing in this test is going to be the um, section two, free response. This is a very short, this is not that hard this time, so uh, I'll quickly go through it. So it says create and initialize a variable represented with the name myVar that stores the number 13. So in order to do that, I do int, right, int myVar, which is the name of the variable, equals the number 13. And again, I chose the data type integer because 13 is a whole number. Then it says, um, create an initialized variable represented with the name my2 that stores the value times 2.5 to the closest whole integer, rounding, okay? So what I do is I do um, int my var2 equals, right, 13, or actually my var, because I'm taking my var, times 2.5, because that is what I want. And then if you remember up here, what I did uh, in problem 
15, which is a great, which is literally exactly what I do, I have to cast it by doing plus 0 0.5. So I take the value plus 0 0.5, and I convert this to an integer by doing, um, you know, parentheses int. And you can do it at the end too. I'm just going to move it to the front, you know, just, just to kind of keep it consistent with the other problem. And that is it. That is the, uh, that is the first answer to the free response. And again, this plus 0 0.5 and stuff I explained up there, number 15, you can go back to that part. Then number two, create and initialize the following variables and their values. Let me do that very quickly. I have, in this case, look, I have a decimal. So the best type for me to use is the double type. So double score A equals 96.5. And double score B equals 86.4. Sorry, 86.4. Double uh, score C equals 76.0. And double score or D equals 100. And I'm going to do 100.0 simply because all my other types are in a double. So it just makes sense for me just to do 100.0. Now the next thing is create two uh, variables named score average and score range that calculates the average and the range respectively. So in order to do an average, well, what do you have to do to do an average? You take all of your numbers, you add them together, and then you divide by the total number, right? So in this case, I can say um, double score average equals, and then I sum all of these. So I can do score A plus score B plus score C plus score D, all divided by how many there are. There are one, two, three, four. There are four total. So I take all of them, add them together, and divide by four, or 4.0. And that will get my average. Now, the last thing I want to do is I want to do double um, score range. And the range is, remember, the biggest number minus the smallest number. So my biggest number is score D. So I can say score D minus my smallest number, score C. And that is it. If you did, if you did it just like this in for problem one prob and then 2A and 2B, you got a perfect on the free response. Just check over, um, look at... You know, some things, if you made a mistake, you may be able to quickly correct them. And um, that is pretty much, that wraps it up. So if you have any questions, definitely leave them, leave them in the comment section below. And I will try my best to answer them all. And um, all of the, the everything, so this particular, this particular test will be in the description below. The notes that I wrote also, like the entire summary, will be in the description below. And as well as the college board course description, because that's where a lot of, you know, what what unit one covered will also be in the um, comment section below. So uh, as always, thanks for watching. If you like the video, you can uh, subscribe or like to um, see more content. And as always, thanks for watching.